nation to return to the Lord, to return to Him with fasting and prayers and a love relationship with eyes of pursuit and say, God, I'm going to love you more than anything in my whole life. I feel this is the call right now. When it seems that there is no remedy, God still has a holy prescription. This is the call. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Thousands must gather in cities all across the nation, culminating in Washington, D.C. in August 2008 to cry out to God that a nation will turn back to Him. Will you answer that call? It is an honor to have you here with us and it is an honor to have our speaker. And this Saturday we will be joining with him in Cincinnati along with our pastor who is not quite home yet or he would be here with us tonight. And um, he regrets that he's not here but he will be joining us Saturday at the call. We do want to let everyone know tonight. Um, and I, I have a lot of things to say but I, mean, I just feel that tonight is going to awaken something in each one of our lives. Amen. But um, we want to let you know that if you desire to go to the call, we are leaving the church in caravan style. But the Bible College is leaving at 7 a.m. You can sign up for that. But if you're a student in HPS, Next Harvest, and you want to go to the call, there's some um, sign-ups in all the four years. We're going to be leaving this campus at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. And it's going to be an incredible day. We encourage everyone to go. And I'm sure after tonight, there will be no doubt in your mind you'll want to be there. Our guest tonight is Lou Engel. He is the founder of the call. It is a solemn assembly. It is a solemn assembly of movement. It is a solemn assembly of movement of prayer and fasting, a gathering of young adults to pray and fast for their nation and for the world. A few quick facts. The call began seven years ago in Washington, D.C. And we, everybody say we, are a part of a revival of the call. Just a few months ago in 7707, over 80,000 young people filled the Tennessee Titans Stadium for prayer and worship almost all day long. Just last month, over 20,000 people packed an NBA All-Star Arena for the Call Las Vegas. And this Saturday, January 12th, Lou Engle, along with our pastor, will lead us in the call in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he's here tonight to speak to us about that, to fire us up and to set our hearts ablaze and awaken us to a brand new revelation of what it truly means to pray and to fast for a generation. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome to the World Harvest Church platform, Lou Engle. Let's just remain standing. Thank you for uh, graciously having me here. I'm mean, thankful to Pastor Parsley. Obviously, I'm in trouble already. I'm losing my voice. And i got a lot to do over the next week, so you can pray for me. But I, I want us to pray for America right now. We, we cannot go on shedding innocent blood in America. Lord, we just pray that you would have mercy upon us. Out of the great state of Ohio, where the great abolition movement came forth, where the Underground Railroad was. Father, where Finney's bones lie buried. God, we need a third great awakening. 
Oh God, give us a desperation. Wake us from our complacency. Lord, you, you've always raised up prayer, massive prayer, for great outpourings of the Spirit. And we say, Lord, would you visit us, God? You have an answer for our inner cities. You've got an answer for our universities. God, come, Holy Spirit. We thank you what you're doing all across the nation where prayer is exploding. 24-7 in universities, 24-7 prayer exploding. God, everywhere men and women are lifting up holy hands, you're about to do something. God, we just cry out for mercy for our nation. Lord, we pray, raise up a righteous leader, Lord, that God would bring forth the plumb line of righteousness and the measuring line of justice. Father, we are praying that, God, you would awaken your church to the issue, to the crisis of the hour. We pray that you would raise up an army of young and old to call on God. I pray that 2008 will be known as the year of the great prayer meeting revival. Lord, as it was in 1857, God, explode intercession, fasting and prayer all across the nation, yes, even across the whole globe. We say, Lord, 60 years ago you raised up fasting and prayer and Billy Graham and Bill Bright were born into their ministries. Israel became a nation. Living God, it's Joel too. When there's no hope for a nation, God, blow the trumpet. We pray for a sound to come forth in America that captures the attention of a slumbering church. We pray that you would release moral clarity into the elections. Father, we pray that, God, we will not be guessing what's right and wrong in these days. We pray that prophets will be heard at this hour, that clear voices would sound, that the pulpits would be ablaze with righteousness. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come. You, we pray that you would come with a movement of compassion through your church to the answers to the social ills of a nation, Lord. Our hope is not in a government program. We need heaven, Lord. But we need heaven to come down and we, we pray even tonight mobilize even out of this great church massive waves of intercession God we pray that Ohio would once again be a turning point the hinge of history in Jesus name this is our call Lord this is we're begging you we're beseeching heaven mercy God mercy Lord God on this year the 40th Anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Raise up an African-American voice that will bring forth righteousness and justice, moral purity, justice for, for, for the oppressed and for the unborn. God, I pray that you would raise up, God, a massive intercession movement to shake the inner cities of the nation. We thank you, Lord, that the civil rights movement began as a prayer movement. There were cries everywhere for freedom. Oh Lord, I pray for a cry of the church to the unborn that can't cry. Let my people go. Let my people go, Lord. We pray here in Ohio, right here in the abolition state, let my people go once again. Father, I pray that you would raise up an underground railroad like you did for the slaves. God, I pray that you would raise up an underground railroad and a movement of adoption, the escape route for the unborn in Jesus' name, for the pregnant mother, raise up an escape route. Raise up an escape route, we pray in Jesus' name. I want you just to begin to pray. I feel a spirit of prayer here. I want us to pray. We've got to get a third great awakening. Unfinished bones, he says on his tomb, may God be with us as he, as he was with our fathers. Let's pray for a third great awakening. Let it begin in Ohio. Let something come forth that won't stop until something breaks. God, we're saying out of Ohio again. Spare the Lord. Raise up intercession. We thank you for the massive movements of intercession that are happening in the universities all across Ohio. Almost unheard of. Oh, Holy Spirit, keep coming. Remember Charles Finney. Raise up evangelists again, Lord, that can rock whole regions, whole cities in Jesus' name, Father. Raise up Theodore Wells, God, the justice preachers, 
Father, we thank you that right to life was begun in Cincinnati. Raise up an abolition movement and a right to life movement again. Another wave, another wave, another wave. We pray that you would release Nazarite consecration on your church. Lord, I pray forgive us for living ordinarily in unordinary times. We pray for the extremism of the John the Baptist. For the shifting of history right now in Jesus' name. I pray you would raise up the young generation of America. They've seen it all. Given everything that they know can, to be given and they're dissatisfied. Oh, give, a generation, give us a generation who are willing to fast and pray until something breaks from heaven. I pray raise up upper room companies all across this city. Oh, Lord, in Columbus. Oh, Lord, in Cincinnati and Cleveland, Lord, do it. In Jesus' name we pray it. We thank you, Lord. We thank you what you're doing. Even now, out of this meeting tonight, raise up intercessors. Raise up revival preachers. Raise up prayer meetings in public schools. Jesus, we, we just cry out again for a righteous president in America, Lord. God, give us what we don't deserve. Give us as an immoral people what we don't deserve. Have mercy on us, God. Give us an Abraham Lincoln, God. And even now we pray for President Bush. That even now in the last half of, of, his, of his rule as presidency, Lord, we pray for a third judge. We pray for righteous judges. Oh, Lord, overrule the courts of men from the Supreme Court of Heaven. Spirit of the Lord. I pray for a spirit of revival prayer to come. Grant the grace of fasting to come on your church. a million ser sermons it's, all, it's the only thing that can open up heaven we've got to return to prayer for the sake of our children oh grant our children a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God give them spiritual hunger a whole generation give them spiritual hunger and desire father Holy Spirit. Oh God, may you be with us as you would with our fathers. Remember Charles Finney. Remember Jonathan Edwards. Remember William Seymour. Raise up voices at this hour. Voices that can shake a nation. Oh God, in the next 10 months, raise up voices in America. Holy Spirit. Father, do something in Cincinnati on Saturday. They'll shift the course of a nation. Not just Ohio. Lord, it doesn't matter how many come. Gather to me my consecrated ones. Those who have made a covenant by sacrifice. Let them call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. Gather the consecrated ones, Lord, who come to do business with heaven.
Lord, we pray in the presence of the hosts of heaven tonight, around that, in that crystal sea before your throne, we gather unto you, O God. Lord, the Ancient of Days, let the courts be seated. Let the books be open. Cut off the horns of the boasting, of the boasting horn. Cut off the boasting horn in America. For justice. We worship you, Lord. You're the Lord who rules over history. In the darkest days, Lord, we say in American history, you have always come. You've come with waves of revival. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. God.
before the call in 2000 this continue for a moment I had a dream in which I was overwhelmed with the impossibility of seeing America turn back to God but in the dream Luke 1 17 downloaded in my spirit in the dream and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the rebellious back to the wisdom of the righteous and I woke up out of the dream and the Lord spoke to me he says what I'm pouring out in America is stronger than the rebellion <laughs> speaking of the spirit of Elijah that would come on John the Baptist he prepared the way he lived a fasted lifestyle Jesus said he was, he was a burning torch and you enjoyed his light for a little while. Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Starting with one man, a whole generation was marked by spiritual violence. I tell you, we have got to recover this for our day. So, Father, we pray. I, I just pray that tonight you put something in us that would drive us out of our nice, comfortable, middle-class Christianity. Drive us to the uh, abandonment, to revival and awakening, justice in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I have a, a book here uh, that I read maybe 25 years ago called Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting by a man named Derek Prince. The book became my textbook for 25 years. I didn't have much of a left brain, so I couldn't organize anything. So, so all I could do is fast and pray. <laughs> Sometimes we need somebody, some folks, that don't try to organize the whole thing. You've got to get God back on the scene. We just have to, we have to get God back on the scene. And uh, they wouldn't let me preach either because uh, I thought I was the best preacher. That's why they wouldn't let me preach because I had no character. <laughs> so the only thing I could do is you got to preach to somebody. So I just preached to God in prayer. <laughs> And they held prayer meetings for 20 years, 25 years, praying for revival and pitiful little prayer meetings. And then something happened. And um, it's like my prayer meeting became 400,000 in a day. John the Baptist had said he was out in the desert until the day of his public appearance. I tell you, if you can pray long enough in secret, God will pull the curtains and take your prayer meeting public. We need, we need again a generation that that, that I don't uh, that, that knows how that goes to prayer, because our only hope is God right now. I just got a, uh, an email from James Dobson's assistant today, and we've been communicating with him, and he said. We agree with your assessment. There is no hope for America apart from prayer, massive prayer. It was in 1997, I think I told this story, but I'll tell it again. Promise Keepers put a million men on the mall in D.C. A week later, I held up the picture of the USA Today report of Promise Keepers speaking to 600 kids, and I began to prophesy the hearts of the fathers are turning to the children but the hearts of the children are going to turn to their fathers and there's coming a corresponding gathering of young people to the mall and, and they will be a John the Baptist extreme fasting and praying generation 
And when they go to the mall, it will be a sign that America is turning back to God. Of course, I had no way of organizing such a thing. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so uh, for a year and a half, I just, we just prayed and we began to just pray that God would fill stadiums with young people fasting and praying. And in 1999, a, a woman came to me. I was praying this prayer. I was praying, how can I turn America back to God? And I was just groaning this prayer. I just, uh, and, uh, and a woman came to me and said, you don't know who I am. But the Lord spoke to me that I'm to pay your salary this year because you're going to start something with the youth of America in prayer that will change the destiny of the nation. I didn't quite know what to do with it, but three months went by. And then she said, have you ever thought about putting kids in the mall like promise keepers? And I said, ma'am, I prophesied it two years ago. She said, I'll give you $100,000 to start it. It started a supernatural series of events that 400,000 kids gathered together to fast and pray. We told nobody who the speakers were, nobody who the worship teams were, because we said we have enough personality-driven religion in America. We have to get God. We have to get God back on the scene. And his prescription in times of crisis is Joel 2. Drop every race, difference, every gender, gather the old, gather young, and let them fast and pray. When there's a crisis, God says to Esther, when there's a death decree like Roe v. Wade in the land, you're not going to try to make that up. You're not going to win it by politics. Esther's got to go on her three-day fast, and in a day, the whole policy shifts from a death decree, and Haman... The Supreme Court dude falls and Mordecai takes his place. When there's no hope for Nineveh, united massive fasting and prayer turns the tide. When massive armies are coming against Jehoshaphat, there's only one hope. He calls the whole nation to fasting and prayer, which unleashes supernatural folks. We're, we're done. We need to war for the political realm. But our only hope is to get into a... We need to lobby a higher throne. The prayer meeting is the greatest lobbying organization in the nation. We lobby a higher government. That woman came to me the same month, a year later, but before the call. My son Jesse was 12 years old. And he had a dream. Because this is a father and son thing. This is a generational thing that's got to come down. We can't riff, afford another generation gap like the 60s. The generations have got to move together. My son Jesse had a dream at age 11. In the dream there were two gangs fighting. A God gang and a devil gang. Went to the leader of the God gang and said, How old do you have to be to be a part of God's gang? And the leader said, the rules have changed. It used to be 21, but now it's 12. I said to my son, you know what the dream is? He's inviting you to be about your father's business at age 12. And it's to be in the father's house, the house of prayer. So my, I'm stunned in January when he turns 12. He comes to me and he says, Dad, I want to be a Nazarite to the call. I don't want to cut my hair for seven months. So the Nazarites were the extremists, like John the Baptist, who, who in times of crisis, God raised them up, and they were mostly a young generation. He said, I raised up from among your, son, your young men, uh, uh, Nazarites, and from among your sons, uh, uh, prophets, but you commanded my Nazarites to drink wine and my, and my prophets not to prophesy until there's a judgment that comes on a generation that doesn't let their kids go radical. In times of radical, uh, ex extreme darkness, God doesn't use a balanced man. He doesn't use a balanced man to t turn back. Sometimes balance is a dirty word. John the Baptist was anything but balanced. 
It said his main meal was locusts and honey, and then it said he fasted often. That means he broke his main meal of locusts and honey to eat nothing. I tell you what, we have got, what happens, years of fasting and prayer, you get a voice. For a man to say when they come to him, who do you say that you are, John? That's a huge question. Two questions you got to ask. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And the second question is, when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist, says, who do you say that you are? Do you know your job description in life? And he says, I'm the voice of the one Isaiah prophesied. Come on. Can you imagine a man saying, I'm the dude in Isaiah that you've read, you've read about for the last 2,000 years. I'm the dude. You think he's... Sh- I, that statement shook a nation. He's the one. My son says, "I want, I, I want to be a Nazarite to the call. I don't want to, I don't want to cut my, cut my hair for seven months." A twelve-year-old, and he says, "Dad, I want to fast for forty days on juice." And Dad, I don't want to pay, play baseball this year. He was the best pitcher in his team. He says, and then after my fast, I don't want to eat meats or sweets for seven months. All I want to do, Dad, is pray for revival with you, Dad. What are you going to tell your kid? Oh, you're a little bit too extreme. No, I I could tell something was going on. He told me that and that night at four o'clock in the morning, I heard the audible voice of God. It woke me up. It was a shaking voice and it was this voice. America is receiving her apostles, prophets, and evangelists, but it has not yet seen her Nazarites. I tell you, God is going to move beyond. I don't know how to say this, but it's not about big names with big A's and big P's and big E's. It's about a breed, a new generation that were created extreme to shift the nation. God, America is receiving her apostles, prophets, and evangelists, but has not yet seen her Nazarites. When I blew that trumpet for that call, I literally had nightmares that no one would come. But at 5.30 in the morning on September 2nd before the elections, People told me I couldn't do it in 2000. I didn't have the organization, didn't have the money. They were right. And I had nightmares where I was on stage and 20 people showed up with four jumbotrons in the distance. And I uh, I I woke up sweating like, God, this is the worst idea you've ever had. But at 5.30 in the morning, Their estimates were there were already 270,000 kids that had gathered in the dark. And they weren't waiting for the band. They were already weeping and fasting and praying. Something's going on in America. And it's in these young kids' generation. God's not about to give up America. But He's looking for something. I just thought I'd tell that story because it, when my son, when my son prayed at the call for the Nazarites, a roar exploded and that video where he plays has gone all over the world in a few months. The call will be in Indonesia and five stadiums will be filled with a million people fasting and praying. It is global. Massive gathering. We're in a Joel 2 moment because it's Joel 2 to Acts 2. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke about. In the book of Acts, it was first down payment, but in the end of the age, it's going to be massive Joel. Fastings and prayer. For the ripping open of the heavens, when we would say, This is that which is spoken by Peter. 
where it says that it, for the great and terrible day of the Lord, he's going he's to pour out his spirit. All across America, I run into kids fasting 21 days, 30 days. Something's going on. You say, well, Lou, you don't have to do that. Well, the fact is, the Asians do it and the Africans do it. And they have revival. And we don't. But it's changing. We did seven gatherings in stadiums. And I'm, I'm just going to tell some stories tonight because I just feel we're in a moment of a massive shift. I feel something right now is getting ready to break. I don't, I, I, and you can feel it all across the nation. Everybody has a sense something's going down. But when Daniel knew it was time, as an 83-year-old man, for the shifting of empires, he doesn't leave it up to the sovereignty of God to get the job done. He sets himself to fasting and prayer, and archangels move to the old man's prayer. Oh, they come down and say, Oh, Daniel, oh man, highly esteemed. This is what heaven thinks of you, Daniel. In your fastings, you're in God's divine intelligence system you've known the times and seasons but revelation demands participation the scripture says the Lord does nothing unless he first reveals it to his servants the prophets but what he's saying there is not just tickling the prophets with a nice prophetic word he's inviting them to participate with him in intercession he's not giving them a movie preview He's saying, I'm showing my servants, the prophets, what I'm about to do. I'm going to give them my secrets. Why? So they can intercede on earth as I'm interceding in heaven to bring it forth. Partic Revelation demands participation. That's why we've, in this journey, we have sought to hear the voice of the Lord and to stand in His counsels and get guidance from heaven. I want to know what he's doing right now. Oh yeah, I'm concerned about the end of the age and eschatology. But boy, I tell you what, I'm not just concerned about that time. I want to know what he's doing right now. So I can make history with him in fasting and prayer. We had these seven gatherings. 2003. I prayed for 20 years for revival in California. I'm going to tell this story because you need to know because I don't tell it to boast. I'm just telling you, I feel that, 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 a, new, that, a, that a new dimension for breakthrough must come. I received a dream encounter from a young lady sometime 1999, 2000. In the dream, she saw a woman dressed in Roman war armor in this body of water and there are huge waves being heaped up by this Roman war goddess people were swimming in the water and couldn't get to their destinies and in the dream an angel appears to her and says the only thing that can break the power of this spirit is 40 days of fasting like Jesus and she says does the dream mean anything to you and I said yeah I think I, I think I know it, who it is I'm not looking for demons but I I think she's on the state seal of California. It's Minerva and it's San Francisco Bay. I think there's a principality of power of Jezebel over the whole state that's seducing the bond servants into sexual immorality. The next day I open a book and it's, I f flip out. It's talking about the spirit of Minerva that made war against men. Welcome to San Francisco. This dream stirred me. For three years I pondered it and I was flying back from the call Korea to mobilize for the call San Francisco. 
where 40,000 gathered together to fast and pray. As I'm flying back, the dream comes rushing back to me in incredible force. And I get this intense desire to go on the fast she dreamed about, the 40-day fast like Jesus, to break something over California. But all I could think about is, God, I've never done a 40-day fast on water. And I'm thinking, God, I'm going to die. And I'm wrestling, and I felt like the Lord speak to me. He says, do you love California enough to die for it? Now we're moving from the realm of prayer to the realm of intercession. Because intercession is about dying. It's standing in the gap and saying, over my dead body, Ohio's going to move. Over my dead body, the elections are going to be shifted in 2008. And oh my, abortion's going to end. Justice is going to come to the inner cities. I mean, we've got to recover something beyond nice petitional prayers. And I'm wrestling with this. And I said, God, I hope I love California enough to die for it. I, but I, I got seven kids. I can't die. You gotta confirm this to me, God. It was real wrestling match. I go to San Francisco, to, uh, mobilized. I came back to LA and told nobody what was in my heart. In the morning of my 50th birthday, five years ago, I get with the young man that was married to the woman who had the dream. First words out of his mouth is this He says, Lou, my wife had another dream last night. In the dream, a woman came to her and said, Lou is fasting the fast you dreamed about three years ago. He thinks he's going to die, but he will not die. Now, suddenly, I have been moved from a nice idea to divine mandate. I am on an assignment. And I fasted for 40 days on water. And I cheated a couple times. So much for the holy men. <laughs> On the 31st day, I was preaching in San Diego. And at the same time, I was praying for my son, Josiah. Because I'd lost his heart at age 13. Couldn't fight. Something happens to teenagers. And on about the 30th and 31st day, God began to give the young man dreams. And he turned his heart back to his dad. Some of us have got to go fight for our kids. Some of us have to fight for our kids. It's a, it's a spiritual battle. And the spirit of Elijah is men who go to fight for the kids. Some of us got to raise our dead kids by stretching ourselves out over them. And on the 31st day in San Diego, I was preaching on the movement of fasting and prayer that broke out in 1946 where literally 46 through 50 thousands and thousands of people all across the world went on an extended fast 46 it begins 47 what breaks out the healing revivals 48 they get a hold of the book written in San Diego they're fasting up in Canada and the latter rain outpourings begin after three months of fasting what happens at 48 Bill Bright gets filled with the Holy Spirit and begins a movement that led to the campus revivals. Billy Graham, 49. Guess what else happens in 48? Israel becomes a nation. It's Joel 2. Afterwards, I'll restore the land. I, it's 60 years this year. I feel we're in another wave of it. I feel we're in another moment for outpourings of the rain, Joel 2. I will give you the early and the latter rain and I will restore the land. I feel like we're in historic moments right now. It's not a time to miss history. And I'm preaching on the, the fasting movement. And I'm in the hotel that night at 1 o'clock in the morning. I have the most outrageous dream of my life. I hope you don't mind me talking about dreams. The Bible's the foundation of the Word of God is the truth. But I tell you what, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. 
you will dream dreams and see visions. I tell this whole young generation, well, it's old dudes, dream dreams too. That's because God created a dream and then wrapped a body around it. When you were born, the dream was there. I mean, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God's dream was there. He wrapped a body around it. That's why old men will dream dreams, because the only thing that doesn't get old are the dreams. And in this dream, at one o'clock in the morning, I am flying over Los Angeles. It's the most outrageous. And I'm roaring the victory of the cross over Jezebel. On the 31st, roaring the victory of the cross over Jezebel. I wake up and my spirit is groaning and roaring. And I knew, I think, I, 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 since I've broken through, something has happened today. And I had prayed for 31 days that God would cleanse me from inward toleration of Jezebel. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel seduces my bond service to the sexual immorality. Praying for the cleansing of my own eyes. You can't bind Babylon if Babylon binds you. That's why Daniel rules over Babylon for 70 years in intercession. Because Babylon, he's in Babylon, but Babylon is not in him. That's why you can't have a sword. You can't shout at the devil if you don't have clean hands and a pure heart. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He with clean hands and a pure heart. It's time for a new wave of holiness. But it's the, it's the holiness of God's delight in you in your weakness. It's not some big heavy head. He delights in you in your weakness. And he's calling you into a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. Where you don't get angry. Or you're yielding to the Spirit. And when you fail, you push delete. And you go on. You receive the mercies of God. But I tell you what, the only thing that's kept me over these years is a clear and decisive pattern of confessing my sins to my own brethren. You cannot walk in hidden sin. It's over with. It shuts down the whole thing. See, we've, got, we've got to move into, into this place of vulnerability. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's Aiken's tent. I heard that message. It's Aiken's tent. I, that, was, that, was, that was a word from God. Anyway... I felt, I knew something had broken. I flew out of San Diego that morning to, to St. Louis. I'm flying out of, out of the airport in San Diego, I look down and I see a big mural on the side of the airport. I forgot it was, it was Charles Lindbergh. It's Lindbergh Airport. Charles Lindbergh's the guy that flew the Spirit of St. Louis, the plane that flew from New York to Paris. Do you remember that? Charles Lindbergh. And the name of his plane was the Spirit of St. Louis. As I'm flying to San Diego, uh, St. Louis, the Holy Spirit speaks to me in the most profound, intimate way. And He says, you're St. Louis to me. And you're flying the spirit of St. Louis. And I begin weeping. I didn't know what it meant. When I got into St. Louis, a brother picks me up and says, Lou, I had a dream of you last night at 3 o'clock in the morning. Two hour time difference, he's dreaming the same time. He said, I heard a voice say, because Lou has been faithful on this fast, I've given him authority over Jezebel into the nations. And wherever the call goes, I will establish my house of prayer. And I was just, I was rocked by this. So I looked up Charles Lindbergh and I found out that the spirit of St. Louis, the plane was built in, in San Diego and its fir first flight was to St. Louis. And the Lord spoke to me, what he did in the natural I want you to do in the spiritual. He did a long distance flight. What you've just done on this 30, on this 40 day fast, he says, I want you to raise up the long distance flyers who fast extended in the heavens to move angels and, de and demons that can literally shift the Hamans, move uh, elections, raise up favor for one, bring down another. Listen, God has never abdicated politics to Caesar. There's a higher throne. That's why Nebuchadnezzar is converted with dreams when Daniel's company prays and why Herod is eaten with worms. When God's church begins to pray, watch out, thrones of iniquity, they all come crumbling down. 
That's why he has called us to pray for those in authority. There's a First Timothy 2 prayer revolution coming on. It's not like Berkeley's rebellion. It's praying for those in authority. For when you do that, you want to lose God to begin to deal with them and shift their ideologies. It may take 20 years, but I'll tell you what, he's going to do it. I say God wants to challenge the university professors with their pagan ideologies, with little companies of houses of prayer. I say there's no safe place for the devil. When that prayer meeting goes and rises up, things begin to shake. All across America, in hundreds of universities across America, 24-7 prayer meetings are going on now. It is a phenomenon. Soon after that, I was going up there to mobilize again for the call of San Francisco. And i just tell this story, and then I'll tell a couple more, and I'll end here. Give me a little time. Yeah. I was stunned when a young man up in Sacramento said, I had a dream, Lou, in this dream. I didn't know who the kid was. I saw a stadium filled with people and platform where kings decree the word of the Lord. And in the dream, Governor Gray Davis of California was in the stands, but he didn't want to, but he had to obey every command that you were speaking. Governor Gray Davis was passing every kind of homosexual law, every kind of abortion law. It was just, it was, it was an Ahab. So we were stunned right after the call San Francisco when something called the recall. The recall began... And California impeached Governor Gray Davis. I think the prayer movement shook a throne of iniquity. Two stadiums, 30 and 40,000, with thousands going on 40-day seasons of fasting. Shh, come on, what about Ohio? What if Ohio, what if this church took the leadership and began to trumpet a sound of shaking and moving things? It's a governmental house. It's not a governmental house just with the apostolic voices. I tell you, it's voices that move the apostle himself who rules in government over kings. Soon after that, I was invited to preach in a black church in San Francisco. I was preaching on the Jezebel Elijah showdown and the homosexual issue. And the guy walks up front, sits in front row. Everyone's looking at him, a tall white guy. At the end of my message, the black pastor says, the mayor of San Francisco has come here today. He said, uh, after the mayor spoke a little bit, he said, Lou, would you pray for him? I got agitated. I laid my hands. I said, God, I thank you that all government is derived from your government. Therefore, let this man know he will be held accountable for everything he does in this city under the government, God. Thirteen days later, he started marrying the homosexuals, 2004. But what happened? The church got roused. Come on. And they went to the closets to pray and out of the closets to vote. I think the devil overplayed his hand through the prayers of the saints to stir the church. So now in California, what we don't do is we don't sustain what we gain. We get breakthroughs and say, oh, wasn't that a great prayer meeting? I tell you, I believe in 24-7, sustaining in the heavens. Moses, as long as he kept up his hands, was a real war was being won. In the, come on. Have you ever thought about it? A real war was being won by intercessors. That's right. I tell you, Iraq will never be won apart from the intercessions of the saints. So we did 777, 75,000 people gathered in Nashville on 777 to say, God, break the 40-year summer of love rebellion, the sexual rebellion that started in 67. You know what California passes right after that? Bill 777. You know what the bill says? Any child, any kid in public school can say whatever gender they are. A male can say, I am a female, and write it down, and then he could go and use the female bathroom. This is enough. That's, that has now been passed in California. You know what's happening? The church bones are rattling now. I think the devil's overplayed his hands in answer to 777. What if the church unites in massive fasting and prayer? Say, God, shake this thing and give us revival. We've got to come out of this drunken stupor that we're in.
And then I'll give you this history. We came, went to Colorado Springs before 2004 because we knew, because I had a divine encounter on an airplane reading a book by Will, about William Wilberforce, the guy that abolished slavery in the parliament. You, you know that guy? And out of this book, I was weeping, and the Lord spoke to me, raise up a prayer movement to end abortion in America. I didn't know what it meant, but I called 50 days and 50 nights of intercession with about 50 kids gathered together in Colorado Springs where we prayed day and night for 50 days, fasting and praying. And we're praying, raise up the African-American church to lead the justice movement against abortion. Can I just say to you, I like these guys right here. You guys, I, 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 can say, I just say this. And I struggle with this all the time because I know, I know that many of the African-American church would not say that abortion is our issue. I believe it is the true heir to the civil rights movement. I was with my friend Will Ford. We were in Montgomery. I was preaching at Dexter Baptist Church with him where Martin Luther King was pastor. And the night before, he had a dream. And in the dream, he and I were picking up Martin Luther King at the hotel to get in our car. And in the dream, Martin Luther King came out of the hotel and he had a white bag with black handles. Before he got in the car, he took it and he emptied it violently out threw it on the ground. Will went to pick up the bag for a souvenir and Martin Luther King grabbed him by the shoulders and said, don't you pick up that baggage that he got in the car. It was a white bag with black handles. There's a new breed of prophets coming from the African American church. The whites have left you a whole lot of baggage. It's how the blacks handle the white baggage. Empty out the bitterness and lead us. Lead us. Out of victimization, lead us into, into life and the breaking of the shedding of innocent blood. You've got to lead us. I don't have an answer. I don't, I don't know the pain of profiling. I don't know the pain of my ancestors being lynched. But I tell you what, if, they can, if the African American leaders can move beyond the place of their own pain, they get redemptive authority because those who are forgiven, more authority has been given. I'm calling the African American church to lead the way to end abortion in America because I tell you what, just like slavery, this is not a black white issue, this is an American issue, this is a survival issue, this is an issue of the shedding of innocent blood, this is not north and south, this is not east and west, this is about a day of reckoning coming to America and I believe I believe the prophets of the African American church have redemptive authority because when Jesus was wounded wrongly he did not raise his voice but he was exalted above every other name because he got redemptive authority suffering gives you authority if you handle it right that's why Joseph got to the palace he went through the pit and the prison God gave him authority oh God I tell you what, there's a false voice trying to arise in America that, is, that literally has ruled that you can have a, a baby that's trying to get aborted and give birth to it and if it's still living, you can kill it. One of our presidential candidates. And people are mesmerized and the church is mesmerized by him. I say, God, let a voice of truth come to America. Let a voice of truth come to America. Right now, the church has got a, we, 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 we got, we got so little moral clarity. Folks, it is not just righteousness abortion, it's justice. It's the plumb line of righteousness. But how is a man going to lead a nation when he can't even lead his own family and have third wedding, third marriage? How are you going to lead a nation like that? And you got our big evangelicals promoting it. Oh God, sir. I am, I am, I might cry. We pray 50 days and 50 nights in an African American church. Raise up the voices of the new breed of prophets. The old guard is going out, but the new, the new guard's coming in. And I think Ohio is ground zero. I think Ohio is ground zero. 
It was out of this gathering 50 days and 50. I, I, I tell these kids, can I go a little longer? I, I tell these young kids at the beginning, I said, you are the RAF. You're the Royal Air Force, the ones that won the battle over, over London when, when German, Germany was attacking. If the Germans would have won the battle in the skies, the German armies would have swept over Britain. And so it was up to the RAF, the Royal Air Force. I said to these kids, you are the Royal Air Force. In your fastings and your prayers, it is your responsibility to win the elections in the heavens. And you will know if you won by who gets elected a pro-life president. That sounds insane, but I told you. And it will be said of you what Churchill said of the RAF. Never has so much been owed by so many to so few. On the 47th night, I got a book in there, but I don't think I brought it in here. The book that led me to Cincinnati, uh, and I'll tell that story, that's not in there, Thomas. On the 47th night, the author of that book appears in Colorado. I was stunned. I'd never met him before. I said, would you come and speak to our kids on the 47th night, the end of his message? He turns to these kids and says, you are the RAF. Never has so much been owed by so many to so few. And those kids are like shell-shocked. On the 50th night, I'm preaching. And I said, Martin Luther King has a dream. He had a dream that segregation could end in America. But I have a dream. I have a dream that America can turn back to God. I have a dream that abortion can end in America. And Dutch Sheets, so a, a prophet intercessor, walks up to me and says, Lou, I, I don't know if you know, but you're preaching on the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. I want to tell you, I have a dream today, and that dream is still Martin Luther King's dream. It is, it is equality for every human being. Come on. If they're not human beings in the womb, you don't believe the Bible. That's the bottom line. And I tell you, it is time for every voice to be counted on this thing. I believe we have come to a time where God is going to deal with this nation. If we don't deal with it in our courts, He's going to deal with it in His. See, this is a stunning thing. Let me tell the story and I'll get there. Out of this 50 days, God led us to go to Washington, D.C. to stand for 30 days, 31 days in front of the Supreme Court a kid had a dream of a piece of tape on their mouths with the word life written on it. How many of you have seen that on the news? Just raise your hands. All across this place. That, that, he had a dream that sees of people had tape on their mouths with the word life written on it. Because we believe that God's smarter than we are when it seems so foolish. We put a line in front, a wall in front of the Supreme Court. And I said, this is the wall of Ezekiel 22.30, I look for a man to stand before me and to build up a wall for me so I would not have to destroy the land. The whole chapter 22 is all about bloodshed. Our kids have been there for three years and we said we will never leave there. And we're not speaking, we're not speaking to judges. We're appealing the blood of Jesus. Have mercy on us. We're saying, God, hold back your wrath. God, give us righteous judges. Three years of an intercessory stand. This kid who had the dream had been on two years, listen to the Nazarite consecration. For two years, he had fasted meats and sweets, praying for the ending of abortion. His name's Brian Kim. He's a Korean, like a spiritual son of mine. For two years, he prayed on a Daniel fast, no meats and no sweets, after President Bush was elected. Not that he's the greatest president, I'm not saying that. All I know is this, he's given us two judges and partial birth abortion is no more in America. That's an answer to prayer of these kids and your prayers and the prayers of this house. And he says, God, I'm ending my fast. I want to eat cake tonight at midnight. God, unless you confirm to me that you want me to go stay on my Daniel fast. That night at 10 o'clock at night, he was going, he was going to, his, uh, to, to study at the library at his school. He sees a guy that runs into a guy he doesn't know and he says, and he's on his Daniel fast. He says, hello, my name's Brian Kim. And the kid says, hello, my name's Daniel Fast. <laughs> it was a Jewish kid. Everybody laughed. 
Yes, but it's not a laughing matter. And you know what God was saying? Son, you're moving angels and demons. You're highly esteemed in heaven. Come on, folks. The church was made to make known the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers. Our vocation is up there. Come on. Our vocation is up there. We're trying so hard to pound it out in the earth and we need to do that. But you can't pound it out in the earth unless first of all it's been pounded out in the heavens with fasting and prayer. We went and stood in front of that Supreme Court for 30 days with that life tape on. Right before that a gal had given me a dream. Some gal emailed me from Las Vegas. I met her one time. She said, I had the dream. In this dream I saw a basketball court and Lou, you were on the basketball court. Uh, and all these kids were on the basketball court and there was a demonic barrier there and all the kids were weeping and then Lou you came on the basketball court and you had a referee shirt on and a kid girl, the girl said and a 17 year old girl said Lou Engle it's your time now and I took the hands of those kids and I swept the barrier off the courts I'm a basketball player God speaks to me through basketball courts a referee is a judge over the courts come on He's a judge over the courts. He was telling me, son, you got an army of young people praying. You can rule in the courts of heaven over the supreme courts of earth. Three days before the elections of 2004, I called my kids to three days of an Esther fast. No food, no water. I got a phone call on the final day from a woman working in the supreme court building. She said, we hear that you would like to have a special secret tour. I said, yes, thank you very much. I meet her and she says, years ago I worked in Florida. I lived in Florida and I got a prophecy given to me that one day I'd be working in the Supreme Court and when I was working there, Roe v. Wade would be overturned. And then she said, I had a dream recently that Judge Ginsburg came up to me and said, would you be my assistant? And a week later, Judge Ginsburg walks up to her and says, would you be my assistant? The assistant of Judge Ginsburg was opening the door to a tour of the Supreme Court. And I asked her, is there a basketball court in the Supreme Court building? And she says, as a matter of fact, there is. And it is exactly on top of where the Supreme Court holds its hearings, and they call it the highest court in the land. <laughs> They're on an Esther fast. You know what he's saying? Esther! in her three-day fast, is appealing to the Supreme Court of Heaven to overrule Haman's court. I went up onto that Supreme, I went up onto that basketball court, the judges are right beneath me, and I declare, in Jesus' name, I declare, the courts are shifting this day, in Jesus' name. All I know is that from that point on, two judges have come in, and something shifted. It's not done yet. There's a war. There's a battle for the soul of our nation. I'm going to go. I'm going to hit something here. This is this is so critical I, because the call Cincinnati is about this. The call Ohio. Huh. We launched a 24-hour house of prayer two blocks from the Supreme Court building, shaped like an arrow. Nightline did a show on it. Astounding. These kids have prayed there. It's so much it's stretching out that rod, the arrow of the Lord's victory against abortion, day after day for three years. It's not always 24-7, but day after day, pounding it out, declaring God begins to give these kids secrets. Can I tell a couple secrets? See, if, if, if you run with God, He will let you in on His secrets because He trusts you. The friends of God. One of our girls has a dream, not knowing anything, that a man named John Roberts will be the next Supreme Court Justice one week before George Bush nominates him. Do you think when he got nominated, those kids were not baptized with confidence? Now they know John Roberts is their man. It's, it's, his, it's, our, it's their assignment. I can't go into the whole story. I'm going to read this last one. And then I'm going to tell Cincinnati and I'll end it. 
This is a profound statement. I don't get, I've never been here before. Just let me just one more shot. I think it's important that I'm here. Because, because there's a deposit of faith that can shift a nation right here. A deposit of faith can shift a nation right here. One of our girls, what we would do is we would come together, we eat common meals, we lived in a community together, confessing our sins one to another, we'd study the Bible and then we'd go down to DC and take our stand on the wall and we would always call what we had dream stream. I wrote a poem years ago, if you hang around the dream king, you get into a dream stream. You join yourself to a dream team and you do the Martin Luther King thing. We've been praying that for four years. We've been praying for the mantle of Martin Luther King. For the ending of an uh, abortion in America. And the kids are dreaming their dreams. This girl dreams a dream. Here's the dream. In the dream, she's in a, she goes to this old building and it has... It has a, um, it has this words over it, and it's called, um, sorry, and, 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 and over, the, over the building is, is the words, the who. And it goes up into the attic and finds a series of old books that are needed for the future. Pizza dream? I said, well, that's interesting. Who's the who, a rock band or something? So I, 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 I file it gently, the dream. The next day, I'm on my de- at my desk, and unbelievable, I get an email from a guy, and it says, Lou, I, you don't know me, but you, what you're doing with uh, praying for the ending of abortion, I think is so significant in America. And he said this, but I think I have the key that will unlock the door to Roe v. Wade. And it comes from an old book called Horton Hears a Who. And now I am all ears. Now, the 15-year-old girl dreams this dream. It sounds silly. So, so here's, the, here's the story. It's about Horton, who's an elephant. It was written in 1954. Millions of people. How many of you have read the book? Just raise your hands. Look at this. Millions across America. You talk about the wisdom of God. He uses the weak things to confound the wise. The things are nothing to nullify the things that are. It's about Horton, who's an elephant, who has big ears that can hear what no one else can hear. The sounds of these little who's that nobody can see, only Horton can hear. And, the Repu- and he's not a Republican. He's got big ears and a big nose, a trumpet. He's the prophetic church that knows what's going on right now. And in the dream... I mean, in the, in, the, in the book, the kangaroo wants to kill all the who's because they don't believe there exists. And when I read it, it hits me like a jackhammer. The kangaroo is the kangaroo court. That's why God gave the girl the dream. The courts are killing the little who's because they don't believe there exists. The whole theme of the book is a person's a person no matter how small. And every voice must be counted. Shall I read the last part of the story? And so now they're going to get all, uh, they're in trouble. All the little who's. So Horton says, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Horton called Mr. Mayor. You've got to prove now that you really are there. So call a big meeting. Get everyone out. I think God had the call in mind in 1954. No, I think so. I believe that. I believe we can find our names written in the book. Why would he give a little girl a dream like this who just, who's praying every day for the kangaroo court? Because he trusts her. Because he knows you're going to do something with it. Call a big meeting. Get everyone out. Let every who holler. Let every who shout. Let every who scream. If you don't, every who is going to end up in bezel nut stew. And down on the dust speck, the scared little mayor quick called a big meeting in Whoville Town Square. And his people cried loudly. They cried out in fear. We are here. We are here. We are here. We are here. And that's what they've been crying for 35 years. 
We're here! The elephant smiled. That was clear as a bell, but the kangaroo surely heard that very well. Uh, uh, all I heard snap the big kangaroo was the breeze and the faint sound of wind through the far distant truce. I heard no small voices and you didn't either. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, me neither. Then he, they didn't take Horton through this painful journey and he said, intercessor. That's what happens to intercessors. And Horton called back, I can hear you just fine, but the kangaroo's ears aren't as strong quite as mine. They don't hear a thing. Are you sure all your boys are doing their best? Are they all making noise? Are you sure every who down in Whoville is working? Quick look through their town. Is there anyone shirking? Through the town rushed the mayor from the east to the west. Everyone seemed to be doing his best. Everyone seemed to be yapping or yipping. Everyone seemed to be beeping or bipping, but it wasn't enough, all this ruckus and roar. He had to find someone to help him make more. He raced through each building. He searched floor to floor, and just as he felt he was getting nowhere and almost about to give up in despair, he suddenly burst through that door and that mayor discovered one shirker quite hidden away in the Fairfax Apartments, apartment 12J. 12 is the number of government. J for justice. Fairfax is next to DC. I think it's my house of prayer. <laughs> it's my exegesis of the book. A very small, very small shirker named Jojo, which is short for Josiah. The Josiahs are going to tear down the altars of Baal. Here it is. A very small, very small shirker named Jojo was standing, just standing, and bouncing a yo-yo. It's the youth groups of America that are playing pizza parties when they can have a voice in prayer to shake the altars of Baal. God, raise up the Jojos in America. Raise up the Josiahs. So that their voice could be heard. Right now, we have launched a, move, a movement called Think Fast. It's out of the movement called Bound for Life. Bound, the number four, life.com. Bound for Life. We've started a thing called Think Fast, where kids are fasting on Fridays in their public schools, and they are fasting and praying for the ending of abortion. In two months, over 400 high schools have kids now are praying. It's just multiplying. Folks, prayers coming back to schools. But it is not just something that you do over a microphone. It's kids that are burning for justice. They have a sense that it's their time to make a difference. Not making a sound, not a yip, not a chirp. And the mayor rushed inside and he grabbed the young twerp. Thank you, Dr. Seuss. And he climbed up the ladder of the Eiffelberg Tower. This cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour? It's crisis. The time for all who's who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country. He said he is now moving out of Whoville into the country. I think Dr. Seuss was prophesying in 54. Who has blood that is red? The church. There is a blood that speaks better than the blood of 50 million babies. It is the blood of Jesus. And this is the year to apply the blood. It is time to appeal to mercy through the blood over this nation. I believe it can literally change the elections. I believe right now is the time for all who's who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country, he said. We've got to make noises in greater amounts, so open your mouth, lad, for every voice counts. Thus he spoke as he climbed when they got to the top. The lad cleared his throat and he shouted out, Yop, Y-O-P-P, young ones prophesying and praying. Thank you very much. And that one small extra yacht put it over. Finally, at last, from that speck on the clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean. And the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? They proved they are persons no matter how small. And the whole world was saved by the smallest of all. Out of the mouth of babes, children's prayer movement. We're starting children's prayer movements from this book. How true, yes, how true, said the big grand kangaroo. And were not saying yop, they were saying stop. 
And I was saying, stop, I tell you, every voice has got in the vote of 2008. I am praying, drive this abortion issue like a wedge into the elections. Just like you drove slavery like a wedge in those days. I tell you, that is what God's going to do. God gave us a dream. In the dream, we were going from courthouse to courthouse to courthouse. And then into a long hall that led to the Appomattox courthouse. And there God was planning. He was making uh, preparations to take Roe v. Wade to his own court. Here is the interpretation. If you don't deal with it in your courts, God says, I will deal with it in my court. And my court's Appomattox, after 600,000 men die on the battlefields of slavery, uh, of, the, of the Civil War, why? Abraham Lincoln said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this scourge of war may speedily pass away. But if God wills that it continue until every drop of blood drawn by the lash must be repaid by that drawn by the sword... Let it be said, as it was said 3,000 years ago, the judgments of the Lord are righteous and just altogether. He understood that the civil war was God's judgment on the blood guilt of a nation. It was a day of reckoning. And if that was a day of reckoning for a slavery, what will the day of reckoning mean for 50 million babies in America? The whole nation must arise right now and say no. For that reason, we come to Cincinnati. For that reason, we come to Ohio. For it was in Ohio that the Underground Railroad is. And the slave would say from Cincinnati to his friends who are in slavery down there in the south, if you can only get to Cincinnati, you can find your freedom. If you can get over the Ohio River, you can find your freedom. I think it's interesting that the, that the abolition movement with Theodore Weld started in Ohio, and Ohio became the most abolitionist state in history. More men went to the Civil War out of Ohio than any other state. I think the whole state was a bastion of abolition, fighting for the justice of the slave. I tell you what, it's not an accident that right to life starts right there in Cincinnati, because it's a new abolition movement for the issues of folks we're in the day African Americans lead us in this battle lead us in this thing. don't be said African Americans we missed our day we got our rights but then we missed the day when we could have led the parade of history oh father I've been groaning over this for years now I feel sensitive about it I don't know the lynchings. I don't know your pain. All I know is this. If this blood goes on, there's a day of reckoning for America. And every voice must be counted. Every voice must say stop. It's time. For that reason, we come to Cincinnati and we're declaring that the new underground railroad today is adoption. Adoption is the way of escape. Homes for pregnant mothers. We must reveal the compassion of Christ. There's an adoption movement going on in Cincinnati where they were preparing that there will be couples for every baby that's not wanted in the Shabbat. Every baby that's not wanted in Cincinnati, they're preparing to have couples adopt them. Folks, the church has got to move from dependence on government programs to becoming the head and not the tail. We've got to become the ones that reveal the nature of Christ. We pray and we move angels and demons with our fastings. We unite in massive fasting and prayer. And then we go into the ground with crisis pregnancy centers. We become the answers to our prayer. It is that vision that we go at 10 o'clock on Cincinnati. It may not be a big crowd. It doesn't matter to me. Give me the company that's dead set to see this thing through. God, if he can get two or three, he can shake a nation. So Father, is this vision that we go to Cincinnati and we call on you that Finney's bones will live again. And another third great awakening. Jesus. Brother, I don't know who you are, but I, I feel like I was just preaching to you all day long. I, I feel... Do you know who's just... Who's moved here to Cincinnati? Moved to Cincinnati? Fred Shuttlesworth. Fred Shuttlesworth was the African-American champion of the Birmingham Army. He's come to Cincinnati. I have walked the trail of tears. I have wept in the places of pain in the African American. I don't know the issues of all of it. But I say, Lord, could you heal our nation? I believe that abortion is the fruit of the injustice of the African American and the injustice of the American Indian. It's the blood just keeps going. It says in Ezekiel, because you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. We've got to stop that. You don't want bloodshed. to. I tell you, God is going to raise up Islam. 
to judge America. Just like they raised up Nebuchadnezzar to judge a nation. We deserve it. Islam will shed our blood. I was just in the call, Kansas City. 20,000 people gathered on the 31st in the very building in 1989 where Muslims gathered there and called for oceans of blood. But you know what we did? We gathered together and we called for oceans of blood of Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing. I'm looking for a great communion revival where the blood is washing us once again. I don't even know how to end this thing. I am appealing to you. Gather the sons and daughters, bring them together for solemn assembly. We fast. We tell people, you're here for 12 hours. This is not your day in the sun. You come and you wrestle for the soul of the nation. It isn't pretty. You may not even like what we do. Who cares? Huh. Does someone touch heaven? You know, Stacy said... Why don't you take an offering? I don't even know if you... If you I, I'm not, I don't want an honorarium. If, if we could take an offering, if you'd like to give tonight, you could write out checks to the call. You could come, bring them forward. I don't know how you do it. But I, I almost just say, Lou, I believe the message that you're preaching. I believe it. Say, I'm willing to sow into this thing. I just thank God for you all. You just have... I, I, I know I've gone long, but I really thank you because I've felt the hunger here, the heart. <laughs> Stacy, you wanted to come and take time.